Hello and welcome back to OT the podcast. We are here to talk about watches, time, how to spend it. I'm Andy Green. Andy, I'm Felix Schultz. Have you been doing any crime recently? Uh, just the time for the previous crimes. Nice. How about you? Uh, do an easy time. Um, I'm well. I'm really good. It's been it's been a nice time of the year down here in Melbourne. And do you know what I've really really enjoyed? Daylight savings. No, I hated that. Uh, to be honest, I can't stand it. Um, I was enjoying the fact that I'm just trying to think of our guests. Mm. Today's guest is one of the geographically closest guests that we've spoken to. Yeah. Paul Hatfield, an elite group of Australian guests. Uh, mm. And this, this one is very special because he's actually got hard skills. Uh, unlike Nick Kenyon, unlike Roman, they're, they're all, they can talk about watches. But today's mm. guest, Ruben Scoots. He can make them. He can indeed, Felix. He can indeed. Hails from Australia Capital Territory, Canberra. Have you ever been? Uh, yeah, I've been for work a few times back in the day. Um, <laughs> I like the bus stops, you know. I've, I think I've driven through. I don't think I've ever had the time to stop. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know if I've done anything. I mean, I'm sure I went like in, in school, probably went to Questacon and Parliament House. I mean, know. Ruben Scoots might be the most exciting thing to be happening in Canberra at the moment. Oi, hot take. There we go. Before we get on to Ruben and his uh, incredible watchmaking journey, I've had a watch that's made an incredible journey. And where's this? What is this watch? Where's it? Uh, Do you like that? Uh, I flipped that on its head. Uh, this watch has come all the way from sunny Glasgow. We've got um, some friends there. Yeah, well, it is, in fact, an OT Model 2 and Ordain um, with the off-white dial. Um, no allegiance is owed to Virgil Abloh, RIP, which finally you and I have both got our hands on. We have, finally. I mean, I had them previously when we had the prototypes in. Obviously. Everyone, everyone that bought them got theirs before we did, and then we said, hey, guys. Well, yeah, and in the, in the, in the interim, um, Anodane have kind of blown up more than even before, and I think they are, you know, all hands to the, the enamel firing mill. You know, they've got huge, you know, wait lists and all that sort of stuff. So a little older you and me, uh, we were, you know, down the bottom of the order, order pile, but they've finally arrived and I'm really, really happy with it. I think it's great. Yeah, it's stunning. And I mean, we, we timed that collaboration perfectly, Felix, didn't we? Mm, it's all part of our master plan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've got a quick question for you. Um, if you could only have one of these two uh, OT Anodane watches, which one would it be? I think the, uh, I think the pink. The pink's closer to your heart? The pink is closer to my heart. It's a little bit close to, to OT and us, so I'm going to go with the pink. What about you? Um, I find that interesting because that was the one that um, uh, Anodane suggested. That was that was um, Lewis's baby. Mm. And we, I, I went hard for the, the white with pink. Uh, and I think I, I still, it's new to me, but I think mm. it's, uh, it's a little bit more understated. I think it's going to be more versatile. Um, so I think the different watches for different occasions, you know, more daily, I think I'll probably wear the, the off white more, you know, when I want to splash it up a little, Go you know, ahead. that off white, you know, what would look great on, uh, tell me, I reckon an Artem strap NATO Felix. Andy, it's <laughs> segways just write themselves. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, you're not wrong. Um, especially, I mean, the gray would be good. Black would work. Uh, I think a simple gray, simple gray NATO, um, yeah. really high premium. Obviously it's a lovely premium and ordain watch and it needs a strap to match. That's where Artem straps come in with their gray NATO. I think seatbelt finish, really high quality. You can get it at artemstraps.com, Felix, or you can hit up their Instagram shop via that platform, artem.straps on Instagram. They've been supporting you and I for the whole entire year, which is, you know, can't stop. stop. It's now October. So thanks guys. Uh, so you can support us by supporting artemstraps.com. Nice. Hey, uh, you know, speaking of recommendations, um, yeah. which we make every week to artem mm. uh, you recommended something a while ago. I can't remember if you did it on the podcast or, if we was, this was an actual conversation we had as humans, not podcast mm. hosts. Our online, offline, offline, online relationship, it blurs. Especially if you get in the Discord as well. Like, yeah. I don't know, you know, I, I sometimes forget that's not just you, you know, you and me talking shit, <laughs> which is something I've got to remember. Uh, no, I watched a movie la, the other, la, last week called mm. Palm Springs. What do you think? Andy Sandberg? 
Andy Sandberg. And this is because we got Amazon for a while because we wanted to watch yeah. something and um, it's on there and we watched it going, oh, I don't know, I really know what this is about. I, and then about halfway through, I seem to remember your voice going, it's not what you expect. It's really <laughs> weird. Uh, and it delivered on that promise. Um, Do you like it? I really did, actually. It's sort mm. of like a uh, if Andy Sandberg made Looper, um, mm. which which is pretty great. There are a few things I liked about it specifically. I like J.K. Simmons. I will mm-hmm. watch anything J.K. Simmons does. Uh, and he unexpectedly played a bad guy slash good guy. Who knew? Also, I notice that it was early to the Kate Bush hype train. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean. It's it's kind of an incredible film when you think about it, and you kind of understand why I said it's not what you expect at mm-hmm. all. But then the, uh, I was thinking about the Kate Bush. It makes sense because he's also married to Joanna Newsom. Yeah. Um, so it's like it all makes sense, Andy. So yeah, pump strings. Watch it. Um, don't take Andy's word for it. Take my word for it as well. Yeah. Now you've got both both the hosts, uh, Andy Sandberg. Mm. Possibly. I mean, he's very highly rated, but still, I think he's underrated. I think he is one of the, like borderline comedic genius i wouldn't say he's underrated i think he's rated he's i mean brooklyn 99 has a has a deservedly huge following and i mean it's not all great but he's very very solid if you had known how good this was you were watched two years ago when it came out like that's where i'm saying he's underrated he's not at that level where andy sandberg's in it i'll watch it for like most people for me he is mm. that's why i think he's underrated because i think he's and he does his comedy in a way that's sort of pretty unoffensive I think that's oh, the beauty yeah. of it. Whereas I don't, I don't love all the the Lonely Island stuff. Like, oh, yeah, leave that. That was. I mean, I don't think he even does that anymore. Yeah, and I, I like. I didn't. I didn't love at the time um, the Justin Timberlake uh, uh, in a box. <laughs> like, well, that was Lonely Island. I think that was how he got onto SNL. Or that was the offshoot of that. Oh, anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This movie is great. A lot of his stuff is great. We stand and and Berg. All Andy's are great, Felix. Well, I've been busy. Uh, been doing some keyboard things. Sure. You, know, you know me. I'm involved in a very small way with the launch of a mechanical keyboard recently called Haviki. You helped. You helped as well, actually. No, I didn't. Yeah, you helped no, with some. No, you helped no. with some words. No, uh, the biggest debate was over colorway. One word or two. Well, and it's interesting. Keyboard people, it's uh, it's one or it's two. Uh, watch people, it's one. Um, both, you know, things that we say frequently. But anyway, I uh, just dropped a pre-order for a 65% keyboard. We've talked about keyboards quite a bit before, Felix, because there is some overlap. Mm-hmm. Like Butner from Worn and Wound, big keyboard guy. Yes, yes. He he introduced me to the concept. Mm. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Years ago, that was all he posted before he uh, he really dived into watches. So I think it's because of the mechanical, customizable nature of it all. Even in our Discord, which I don't know if we've said people should join yet, but we have, a, times. We have some chatter in there. So go check it out. Uh, Felix will link up the business Hibi uh, and check out the Hibiki. It's a very, very cool keyboard with a, actually with a polycarbonate bottom piece. So you can see all the internal stuff. Yeah. Kind of like an exhibition case pack. Kind of. I mean, for me, uh, I've, I've seen a prototype. Uh, it's mm. kind of like um, if Apple and Harman Kardon teamed up to make a mechanical keyboard in 2008, mm. it might be what they made. That's very nice of you to say. Mm. Uh, anyway, do you know who probably would, Enjoy a mechanical keyboard? Don't know. Probably today's guest. That's probably make his own. Yeah, probably would. Yeah, Ruben Scoots. We, we, we should we should get him on. We do a Scootsy keyboard. <laughs> Scoot on over. Scootsy's probably a bit too informal. I probably I don't think he would appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but I'm not going to cut it out. Uh, should we call him up? Sure. Andy, today's guest is remarkable. Not only is Ruben Scoots making his own watches from the ground up in the style of George Daniels, he's doing it in Australia uh, which is admirable and great. What's even more impressive is that five years ago, he had zero experience in watchmaking. Welcome to OT, Ruben. How are you this lovely day? Good morning. Well, good afternoon, I should say. Um, I'm doing really well. Thank you. Very glad to be here. Love it. How's the view? The view is lovely. We've got a bit of a grey overcast sky, I'm looking at a big patch of coriander and uh, puppies trying to eat things. So the view is great. So for all of us that aren't with you, you've got a, a workshop that um, looks out into your backyard. I do, yes. And it looks kind of like a pretty typical Australiana backyard. Is there a hill's hoist out there? <laughs> there is a hill's hoist. Uh, I've got the, the classic uh, 1970s shed. And yeah, it's very, very classic Australian backyard. There's a barbecue in the corner, hill's hoist in the middle of the lawn. Oh, 
wasn't. No. I suspect that wasn't what um, uh, George Daniels was imagining when he thought about you know when he wrote when he started his watchmaking methodology. I think the obvious place to start, Ruben. How did you get into watchmaking? Has it been a lifelong passion, or, or what sort of prompted you to embark on this journey? Hmm. I uh, growing up, I. Uh, was sort of in touch with engineering and mechanical things uh, via my father. We restored a uh, a Triumph uh, 1961 uh, little British English racing car. And but no watchmaking and horology in general weren't in my life until um, post travels to South America in 2015. Uh, while I was there, I contracted. Uh, three tropical virus, um, supposedly malaria, Zika, and Chukumbura virus. And I also got a parasite in my stomach. So I, when I arrived home, I was pretty uh, worn out and my immune system was heavily overloaded. And I ended up becoming chronically fatigued and essentially was um, in and out of doctors and stayed in bed for the better part of a couple of years. Uh, but it was during that time that a good friend of mine uh, came over and he showed me he had a, a Seiko on his wrist and, it you know, mechanical movement and we spoke about it and he's an engineer and uh, sort of that piqued my interest. So when he left, I got online and started searching for mechanical watches and I wanted to know how they worked and then naturally the question progressed to who works with them and then how are they made. And it was during that search that I discovered, one, there was hardly any information on how watches are made online, Mm. but I was lucky enough to come across the name of George Daniels. And I came across his work. I found that he'd written a treatise on watchmaking titled Watchmaking. So I ordered that, read it cover to cover, and a fortnight later, I had scoured the internet to buy a watchmaker's lathe and various hand tools. It's not really normal, is it? <laughs> I can do this. <laughs> I love it. I love well, it, it might have been in the midst of the uh, the insanity of of being sick, and you know, it was, and quite a large array of uh, pharmaceutical uh, things that were prescribed. And I think it was, yeah, definitely a time of exploration and confusion. And I, you know, I wasn't working. I'd been put out of work, and mm-hmm. I didn't really have a social life at the time. And I just had time to think. And I, I think with all of that space that had opened up uh, because of uh, becoming unwell, it gave me, yeah, space and time to think about what I would like to do. And at that time, watchmaking seemed like the best option. Were you confident in your abilities? I mean, I, you know, I look at a YouTube tutorial on how to hang a, a picture frame or something and I overwhelm myself and I end up getting on Airtasker. Did you have that confidence in yourself that you're actually able to be, actually able, be able to do this and, and make a watch? Without wanting to sound like an arrogant man, mm-hmm. um, I, I don't think I would have chosen to do it if I wasn't confident that I could. Um, however, in hindsight, um, <laughs> a bit of a fool and a little bit arrogant for sure, um, but also just ignorant would be the main, the main word to describe mm-hmm. the person who made that decision. I could not have known how deep watchmaking could go and how challenging it would be. Slippery slope. <laughs> I, for I, sure. I think the most remarkable thing is that you didn't stop. Um, like once you sort of, you know, came across that hurdle to use Andy's analogy of hanging a picture frame, I'm like, I'd probably try and nail three, you know, screws into the wall and miss the miss the stud every time and then outsource it to a professional, but you you persevered. I'm interested in in acquiring that knowledge and the role that, you know, George Daniel's book and, you know, those YouTube videos plays. How far does that sort of learning get you and where does, you know, real world either experience or, you know, having to speak to someone that, you know, is, uh, is a professional in the field or learning from someone else in real life, where does that come in? Like what's sort of the balance between those two types of learning? The book itself is, it, it's great. It is not, however, a step-by-step, uh, one-stop, this is how to make watches. 
I think truly the most important thing that's been in, in my journey is just being willing to try and willing to fail and trial and error really. And, you know, every time you try again, just trying to improve upon the last effort. I was fortunate enough quite early on in my journey to acquire a mentor and he is not a watchmaker, but he was a career long engineer and he ran a engineering job shop and Lindsay is his name. And Lindsay taught me the art of tool making, which was in hindsight, probably the, the best uh, tool that I could add to my repertoire to become a, a watchmaker. Um, that was something I really struggled with uh, in the beginning, having no knowledge of how tools were made or how to conceive how to make a tool. And so, yeah, I would say very fortunate to be supported by someone like him. Uh, he's, he's turning 80 uh, tomorrow, actually. So, he, you know, he's well retired and he never had an apprentice. So I was very fortunate that he was willing to pass on a lot of his, his knowledge. Uh, second to that was... I was given so much space and time to actually learn um, by my wife, Cielo. And I think without her support, for sure, there would have been uh, many moments in which I would have just said no because, you know, she supported us financially while I was getting my uh, things together, tightening the screws. And as well as as my health was uh, improving, she was there supporting me the whole way. So I think without my drive, and without the support of my mentor and my wife. Yeah, for sure, not possible. But the book, of course, plays an important role. Yeah, I love that. And I think it's 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 quite interesting to hear about the different ways that, that you have learned. And uh, obviously, a mentor is very important. Felix linked me while we're kind of getting ready for this, this recording. Uh, he sent me an excellent, excellent photo essay that Isamu Sawa, uh, one, of, uh, one of our friends here from Melbourne, put together a bit of a photo essay story on... Uh, on yourself up on his website and that's sort of why I, I, I opened with the, um, the question about your view it's pretty typical to see you know watchmakers uh, traditionally lovely views of the hills uh, covered in snow not hills hoists um, and it's it's interesting do you think that you, where you are in the geography of not only being not in Switzerland but in Australia and the ACT has impacted the sort of watches that you make and what you sort of like to do I think undoubtedly. I, of, of course, don't know what it would be like to be a watchmaker in Switzerland, so I can't comment, but I can imagine what it would be like. Um, being a watchmaker here in Australia, particularly being a self-taught watchmaker, and you know, there's, there's no established industry here and there's no history of watchmaking, which has made things, um, has made the, the challenge and the journey unique. However, I do have certain freedoms in what I want to create and what I want to do and how I'm going to do it. So in, in that essence, it is, it's quite nice being here, being quite isolated. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think that is, I, I'm endlessly fascinated by how place impacts something like watchmaking. And I suspect there's, there's a whole lot that goes into that. But it's funny that you talk about sort of, you know, we have no industry here. Um, because you're based in, uh, for people overseas listening, they might not be aware that Canberra uh, or the ACT is is our national capital, so it's basically, you know, a lot of uh, civil servants. Hypothetical scenario for you. You run into the Federal Minister for Trade on the bus and you convince him to make uh, watchmaking, an Australian watchmaking industry a national priority. What needs to happen to make that happen? Education is really the main the main thing. I we I think if we were setting up uh, watchmaking schools here, uh, that would be a great start. Uh, um, you can of course study uh, watchmaking, watch repairing. Uh, that's still uh, available at the Sydney TAFE. Um, however, yeah, the f the first thing would just be education, and second to that, you'd be talking to, well, hopefully, you know, be talking to existing watchmakers. Um, the hackos in Sydney, myself, and looking at in, you know investment in state of the art technology and machinery. Mm. And a related question, uh, a second hypothetical, if you will, because uh, another thing famous uh, Australia is famous for is having this incredible sort of local talent 
that then, you know, goes offshore to, to somewhere else. So, again, you're catching the same bus uh, and you run into uh, Francois Paul Jean. He's impressed with you. He, he loves your, your style and your abilities and he offers you an apprenticeship. Do you take it? Wow, that's an interesting question. I've... <laughs> So, not least because of the fact that our FPJ on a Canberra bus is a hilarious image, I think. <laughs> that, that is also true. The No, I wouldn't take it is the, the, the short answer. Why not? Um, I would have maybe three years ago, I would have. In fact, I was semi-actively looking for opportunities of that nature. But I've, I've come to realize that a large part of my personality and, and my style in, in my learning and the way that I approach my work and my life is I really enjoy this being a challenge that I'm overcoming. And I really want to be making my own watches and I'm doing that. So I, I don't see any reason to, uh, to stop, you know, to put a pause on that, to go learn from a a master watchmaker, sure, it would be great and would probably uh, speed up the process in many ways. But I, I do believe that it would also, um, it would influence my the way that I work so heavily. And I'm so intrigued by what I can become without influence. That's interesting. Like, uh, and I really find that interesting that, you know, three years ago, you would have, you were, you were actively trying to do it. And, and I completely getting, you know, wanting to sort of do it on your own. Do you think that in you know, maybe another three or five years' time, you're going to reach a point where in your own journey or development, you decide you do want to be, you know, to have that uh, learning experience from, a, from an established master? Would you, or are you confident saying that you'll, you'll never really sort of work with anyone else and you're always going to be a sole operator? I, the way things are progressing and, and the way things are at the moment, I would reasonably confidently say no just because i'm um happy stable comfortable all of those good things however i, I truly can't speak to the future you know in, in five or six years for sure if an opportunity presented itself and um you know things were different with the business here for sure i would i would be happy to take opportunities like that well you are you mentioned being stable Obviously, you know, you've passed the point of kind of teaching yourself how to make tools and make watches and you've actually, you're actually in the process of, you know, working on the first series of six watches. Uh, we read that they were all allocated within 40 minutes, which is pretty incredible. How did it feel to put them out into the world? Yeah, it was a pretty remarkable experience because it was four, uh, four years prior to that where I was really trying to uh, be an independent watchmaker and it wasn't until the watches had sold or pre-sold that I really felt like there was some sort of validation or it was confirmed so it was a really um, a really important moment for me in my career uh, my wife and my parents and I we, we celebrated that moment with a bottle of champagne and just recognition of um, yeah it, it was a very important moment for me the, the watches are in the finishing stage at the moment, so they, they haven't been released into the wild. I imagine that's going to be another moment that is going to be uh, incredibly important. And if I think about that moment, I become excited, anxious, and yeah, a combination of those two, those two feelings. And yeah. Lovely. And where can we kind of like see pictures of the watches? Because one thing I noticed is, uh, it's actually quite hard to find details. I mean, you're making only making six, but what do they look like? How much did, how much did they sell for? What's, what's planned for the future? Yeah, the, um, I haven't released a photo of the – I made a prototype yep. last year and um, it's, it's actually on my wrist. And I didn't end up releasing photos of it because the watches were pre-sold and I sort of just moved on from there. And the prototype, of course, wasn't finished to the standard that I would hope that my that the series would be finished to. So I sort of just passed in the opportunity to to publish that. However, there will be uh, at some point in the very near future 
uh, Nick Kenyon is going to publish uh, something with a photo of, of that prototype. He's got an exclusive. Exclusive. I want Exclusivity, to... yeah. So so what was the price point? Of the watches? Yeah. They were 15000 So six six at fifteen grand, 90 k of watches, no photos. Uh, that's a lot of people backing you, right? That's a lot of support of... You know, a prototype. I imagine you sent photos of the prototypes around. But how does that how does that feel to kind of quietly be able to do that? Uh, it was very validating. Mm-hmm. That is that is for sure. Uh, it gave me confidence in the future. Uh, but uh, most importantly, the the fact of the price of the watches is they were severely underpriced for the length of time, the amount of labour, the cost of living in Australia, etc. And that was uh, a big lesson in itself as well. So I sort of went from in the beginning feeling, you know, over the moon and ecstatic that they sold for that price and validation all the way through to the other end of the the project now going, whoa, that was <laughs> a, a financial mistake. <laughs> less, less, lesson learned. I imagine, yeah, I imagine you could sell it for multiples of that if we're, if we're honest. And it sounds like there's some really important um, people in the watch industry that are backing you and they obviously have really high expectations of a, essentially your potential, right? Like these are people saying we're gonna we're gonna bank, you know, bank to financially bank back this guy, and and we think he's got what it take what it takes. But not only that, people are talking about you, Ruben. Uh, you know, Australia's a small place. There's not many. I mean, it's a big place, but it's not, the industry is small. You know, you mentioned the hackos, and, that, and that's basically it. But people are talking about you and have very high expectations of your potential. Not even what you're doing, but your potential. How how's that feel? Um, it was fine about I, it until you just put the picture on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's sort of – I hadn't really thought about that. Um, so, sorry to just send your world into a spin, but I, I compare it to, uh, you know, like an athlete that gets drafted at a really young age and everyone's sort of, this is the future, this is the future. And people are sort of saying, this, you're the future of Australian watchmaking, right? Um, and I just wonder how, how that sort of feels because I imagine the people that bought those six watches are pretty serious. It's it's truly encouraging. Mm-hmm. I it's you know um, when I had to sell myself, not selling the watches, but when I had to tell my community, my family, my wife, uh, my friends, oh, you know, I want to drop everything and I want to make um, at the time I want to make a Daniel's Tourbillon watch. Selling that, like making that pitch, was was quite difficult, yeah. and it it really. It was my mission for the first three years, just my mission to ensure that people around me would understand my seriousness and my dedication. And I think that is sort of playing itself out in its next phase, which is expectations uh, mm. have, have been put out there. But I'm, I'm aiming up and I would like to... You know, I have aspirations of of doing wonderful things in horology, and you know whether or not we get there is that's completely different. That's up to me. But my my aspirations and my my energy and my motivation are ten out of ten. That's I mean that's uh, a really good uh, analogy Andy made about the you know the the sort of the, the rookie star um, of the year and the way you just spoke about your own self belief. I think is exactly how you would sort of expect to hear like a, a young athlete talk about their future. And I, I'm really interested to see where, where you know, uh, Scoot's watchmaking ends up. Um, uh, I know, so you've got the, this initial series of six. I'm really interested how many of them, if you can say, uh, and f- feel free not to, uh, how many of them do you think will stay in Australia? Uh, no, I, I can't say who they've gone to, but hmm. I can say where they've gone. Um, there, none of them are none of them are staying in Australia. Oh wow, interesting. Yep. And I, I think that's I feel reflective. I feel Singapore's <laughs> snapped them all up. Yeah. I, I got another. I, I sort of want to ask. So these watches, they're not the full Daniel's uh, approach, are they? I understand you've got some some CNC and some CAD work uh, Most involved. Certainly. Yeah, I um, you know, I had a really interesting conversation with um, my mentor again, Lindsay, and he he was an early adopter of CNC machining in Australia. He he built his own CNC machine in 1980, 
and wow. he's, he's since made many more and he came to me one day and he said look I think you need to get into CNC knowing full well that I was no George Daniels handmade etc and he sort of said to me look you know that no watchmakers nowadays don't use CNC and it's not like a it's not a problem and it's this this like sort of George Daniels method has created some sort of strange moment in in time where you know historically speaking watchmakers were on the the cutting edge of technology if not developing technology and at no point in history did a watchmaker say you know use Breguet as an example he didn't just in some moment say well I'm not going to use any technology after 1770 because I don't agree with you know this new method it's it's less traditional mm. and uh, Lindsay sort of put it to me in a way and saying, you know, I think it would be, you would actually embody being a watchmaker more fully, more wholly, if you were to be using the cutting edge of technology. So he said, why don't we make you a CNC machine that can work at the precision level of watchmaking? And I dived in head first and said, absolutely, let's do it. So we spent uh, a month, we spent four weeks and we, we made from scratch a, a little CNC machine, very high precision. And that was an amazing experience for me. One, because we built this machine. So of course that was fun and full of learning and we, we made all of the mechanical elements of the CNC. Then he said, right, you're on your own now, go and do all of the programming, put all the motors on it, make it, you know, make it, make it a robot. So that was another month of me by myself figuring out, you know, I had to make all the plugs, do all the cabling, all the wiring, all the chips, all the programming. And it was in that time when I realized I love computers. Well, not that I realized, actually, I, I sort of revisited a love that I had for computers. I, when I was in high school, I was quite obsessed with computers and I used to buy, you know, components and I was quite into overclocking, modifying computers, making them faster than they, they should be. And all of a sudden I realized that these were the two big interests that were in my life it was mechanical and computers and CNC is just the combination of the two mechatronica. And I truly fell in love with CNC machining. It's like the, the possibilities that it opens up for a watchmaker to be creative, to iterate at a, at a faster pace and to make really high quality work like a modern wristwatch is it's second to none. Um, I'm super passionate about CNC now and I can almost sort of laugh at myself previously for being against it. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. I mean, I'm excited to hear where that, um, where that takes you. What is, you know, imagine, you know, you're sort of you're in the finishing stages of the first series. What's the next series look like quantity wise, uh, design wise? What, what are you thinking for the sort of second series? Nothing's been finalized as of yet. However, the second series will be more involved and it's going to i haven't actually determined if i'm going to make six again to keep things the same or if i'll go the routes you know sort of roger smith's routes where he has a series that you know he'll produce indefinitely and you know will be available as a roger smith watch indefinitely or if i'll do something like this first six again that's you know just exclusive or if i want to make one at a time and just make one and then the next one and the next one that hasn't been decided but the the watch itself and what the watch will be is going to be just an evolution of the first series you mentioned sort of you know how you've changed your attitude to you know cnc and and i understand have you completed your sort of uh daniel's method pocket watch yet or is it still a work in progress the pocket watch is still a work in progress. It's, I have one component to make for the movement and then I have to make a case, a dial and hands. And I had yeah quite a difficult time actually putting that aside and ceasing work on it for, for the time being. However, it was, um, I've, I've really changed my perspective of what that watch is. And that watch truly is, um, it's a, it's a journey and it's, it's, um, it's an exercise in not only watchmaking, but setting up a workshop that can make watches and actually just like obtaining the mindset 
of a watchmaker. And at this at the present time, I'm I'm quite happy for that project to remain open for many many years and just you know work away on it very slowly and improving bits as I go. And you know I've actually I've remade the watch multiple times over over the uh, four and a half years, and I'll probably remake it again. And it's just an exercise in in getting better. That's that's quite incredible, and I really um. Uh, you know that really obviously I don't have any practical skills uh, like you do, but that, that's really something that resonates with me. Um, it's interesting, you, you know. George Daniels holds such a uh, mythic sort of status in you know twentieth century watchmaking, but famously he was a pretty grumpy dude, um, and, and <laughs> you know not easy to get on with. Uh, are there people working today that you also look up to, or that you sort of? you would aspire to be, you know, in their sort of, you know, their peers or, you know, in the same, you know, mentioned in the same article or whatever? Hmm. I've, of course, looked at, you know, all of the independent watchmakers that have gone before me or who are, you know, maybe at the the peak of their career at, at present. And I've also thought heavily just about what I want, you know, my my life to be like, my lifestyle and, you know, do I want to be running a company? Do I run around a small business? Do I want staff? They're sort of the, the biggest questions I have at the moment. And I do look at other watchmakers and, you know, look at their business, the size of their business and what their role is. You know, it's like, do you want to make watches or do you want to run a company? And they're both valid paths. Uh, however, at this, at this stage, I would, I, I really do admire as you know, as cliche as it as it would be, I really do admire Roger Smith, and mm. I really admire his business model. I think he's got a, a perfect, uh, perfectly sized business that, from the outside, is still allowing him to live his life, and you know he's not running some big company, and it still seems that he is still very in touch with with the watches, and there are a couple of other watchmakers as well that I. You know, I look at and I think, yeah, that's a position I would like to be in. Not of success or not of copying their product, but actually just looking at their their business model and their their lifestyle. I I want to be there for my wife. I want to be a great husband. I want to be there for my family. I want to have a social life. But of course, I want my watchmaking to be my main and my core focus. How can I make that happen? Yeah, that's really um really sort of a, a healthy way of thinking about it. I think. Quick, you, you sort of spoken about, you know, that looking up to other sort of people and, you know, looking at other business models. Have you sort of found that there's any um, support? Like if you have a particular problem, I don't know, about some, you know, getting a, getting a click to work or, you know, some sort of architecture issue, can you reach out and ask someone else in the, you know, the watch industry or is it a bit of a closed shop to you? Um, I... I've only very, very recently actually begun communicating with other watchmakers. I have never specifically reached out and asked somebody for help with with any of the any of the watchmaking, and I I think that's probably uh, I don't know if that's a good thing. I, I've sort of been thinking about that recently, like oh, you know, may, maybe it would be good to to begin reaching out and you know developing relationships with people who could you know help me and you know ideally in a good relationship where you know help other people as well um but yeah i I really haven't no (laughs) is the short answer no i i don't have really anyone to reach out to well i'm sure i'm sure you'll make some friends along the way Uh, i have a question about what what watch do you wear do you wear one of your own timepieces prototype or do you do you rock your your seiko still i um i go between a couple of watches Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) and I dropped my Seiko. Um, it flew off my wrist when I was running one of my bigger lathes and, um, classically I, I don't have the time to get around to fixing it. (laughs) So it's sort of just sitting in a bunch of pieces on the, uh, on the bench and I wear the, uh, the prototype that I made. And I also just wear a, a, um, a GPS watch, which is, I I bought that I was I went through a couple of years ago a, a phase of doing some stupidly long runs and I really wanted to record them um so you know can record running activities and whatnot but then I I was running uh, parallel to my watchmaking I was running a 
clock uh, conservation business. And the GPS watch served as my, my timekeeper, my regulator. I've always found this interesting and I don't have, so I, you know, obviously talking, you know, 95% of my time about watches. I've always thought that clock people are a really related but separate breed of like collector or repairer. Is is that true or is that just my sort of outside perspective? No, I would tend to agree. For sure, there are over overlapping interests. However, it, it really is two separate things. The the collectors seem to be a completely different demographic, as do the makers. And I've found that quite interesting. Um, I uh, got into the clock conservation as I needed to earn an income and I wasn't prepared to make watches or sell watches until I was you know, truly confident I was going to make something worthwhile. So I began the, the clock conservation business as a, as a means to to remain in the workshop and to earn an, in, earn an income while I was, you know, being, while I was preparing to, to actually sell watches. Um, but for sure, I don't have any customers or any collectors from the clock side of things that mm-hmm. interact with anyone from the, the watch side of things. They seem quite separate. Yeah, interesting. I would, I would like a, a, a BAU question, business as usual, um, just to dip into your mind for a second. Do you ever have days? Because obviously like your process is quite slow. You're doing it all yourself. Sometimes you're making machines. Sometimes you know, you're polishing screw head, uh, recess chamfers. Do you ever have a day where you just kind of like it, it just flies by and you feel like you haven't done that much because of the process of what you're actually doing? Yeah, all the time. It's um. You know, you, you know, and you'll have like a day where it's sort of like, it seems like it's like the pinnacle of, you know, you were sort of building up to that day for a month. And then on that day, you got, you got all of those things done that you were sort of preparing for. And I always fall into the trap of like feeling like that day of ultra productivity is like how I should perform every day. So then on the days that aren't like that, it's, you know, what have I done? What am I, what am I doing? Just recently, you mentioned the, you know, the polishing the, the screw head recess the chamfers and that was a classic situation of me not asking how it's done you know of course there is of course there are various methods that would be employed by the swiss in their watchmaking to do that but i really wanted to work it out for myself in a in a way that was repeatable efficient and you know with a good result Mm. so i spent I spent uh, the last two weeks just making tools and just trialing different methods to work out how to do that. And I ended up settling on uh, getting a, a ruby sphere and well, I got a, a raw ruby and then, you know, ground it into a sphere and polished it with diamond and, and that gave me the result that I wanted. But I did feel like the day before yesterday, I still hadn't achieved a polished chamfer in two weeks that I was happy with. And that day, for sure, I had, you know, had a bit of uh, thinking to do. And I thought, you know, I've, I've not progressed at all and I've put in so much time and effort. But then just like magic, the next one that I tried, boom, that's the result that I wanted. And then, you know, then you get all of them done in a, in a sort of um, efficient manner. God, watchmaking's nuts. It's wild. Like, oh, yeah, that's that's – not just an incredible process, but that must require so much like mental resilience to be able to work like that. Well done. Um, Ruben, the next question I'm going to ask, uh, I don't want it to be about watchmaking at all. We always ask people that we speak to for a recommendation of something they've been enjoying in their life that, that doesn't result, relate to watches, doesn't relate to work. So, you know, maybe it's a, a pastime, uh, something you've been watching on Netflix, something you've been listening to. What have you been enjoying recently? Jeez, this long pause makes it just seem like I'm not enjoying anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, well, to be honest with you, just recently my, my wife and I, we got a, uh, a second puppy. So we've, we got him a month ago and he's been a real focus for the last, the last little while. And there's been a real focus at home as well. So I, I truly enjoy on the weekend I truly enjoy doing, you know, an odd job at home, improving the house in, to some degree, and I really enjoy just spending time with uh, with the pup as well. What sort of puppy? While he's, while he's still cute, 
He's a Basenji. Oh, what's that? He's a um, a native dog from Africa. Oh, like uh, they're from the Congo originally, and they're a separate uh, species uh, to the wolf and to the fox. So they're um, not related to any other domesticated dogs. Uh, I think it's associated with the Spitz Spitz family a little bit. I believe it is, yeah, originally. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's a they, distant yeah, they, cousin they, from my dog then. Okay. Yeah, they're an interesting dog. They they don't bark or they can't bark. And they there's sort of somewhere in between a dog and a cat. They're, they're very interesting. Hunting dogs as well. Yes, they are. Yep. <laughs> interesting. They, yeah. They like to they like to hunt. I love it. I love it. Uh, Ruben, thank you so much for joining Felix and I today. Uh, when we have some images, we'll share them and we'll link up the article that Izzy did uh, that we talked about and anything else. And we wait with bated breath to see your finalized watches and designs. And not only that, um, maybe Felix and I can go Harvey's on a Series 2 timepiece. Yeah, well, we should have invested into a Series 1. I don't know if, mm. I don't know if we'll be able to afford a Series 2. <laughs> We'll find some other local investors then. Yeah, let's do it. Put a syndicate together. Thank you so much, Ruben. It's been lovely chatting to you. Thank you both. That, that was uh, really nice. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about myself. Great to chat to Ruben Skirts. Can't wait to see uh, his initial debut offering and what you know whatever comes next. I think that uh, it's great to see someone doing such cool stuff in the Australian watchmaking scene, uh, not just watch enthusiasm, which there is obviously a lot of, but... Yeah, thank you so much, Ruben. You know, really great to chat. Really great to see what you're up to. Andy, who else do we need to thank? Obviously, Adam Straps for supporting the show. All of you guys listening, everyone who's in our Discord, people Apple. leaving five star reviews, and of course, spreading the word about OT the podcast, telling all your friends that are into watches or I don't know Andy Sandberg films. Let them know about us. Sure, sure. We need to do like some sort of watch spotting. Watches of Andy Sandberg. He probably doesn't wear a watch. I don't think I've ever seen. Uh, don't think I've ever seen it. Yeah. Anyway, well, uh, thank you so much, Andy. Let's uh, go watch some more Andy Sandberg films. Let's catch you next week. Let's crack on. See you next week.